Try this. Yay. Okay. I'll do a brief intro and then we'll go to this. All right. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of our evolution seminar series. T today, we'll be talking about everyone's favorite virus as we're joined by Professor Tomic Thomas Friedrich from the School of Veterinary Medicine. So without further ado, let's get right into the science. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Thomas Friedrich. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I know people are getting tired of hearing about COVID, but uh, COVID is not done with us. So I think uh, it's important to understand um, how variants arise, how they're going to continue to do that, um, and what the trajectory of virus evolution might be in the future. And so what I want to do today is kind of review for you the evidence that we think is pointing towards um, one of the most significant sources of new variants of concern, uh, which is persistent infections with SARS-CoV-2. And I'll try to convince you that although such uh, infections might be relatively rare, they will have outsized uh, importance for the future of viral evolution. Okay, um, so we all know that influenza virus vaccines need to be updated on an ongoing basis, right? And so the reason why we have to do that is because there is an ongoing process of influenza virus antigenic evolution at the global scale with so there's like a evolutionary arms race between the human uh, immune response and the virus. And so if we just sort of follow over time, this uh, graph that I stole from my colleague, Trevor Bedford, basically shows that every few years, there is a new influenza vaccine virus that we need to incorporate into the vaccine to keep up with this evolutionary change in the virus's antigenic properties. So it's constantly escaping from our sort of collective um, immune response. Mostly this is um, uh, selective pressure that's exerted by antibody responses. Um, which I feel bad about saying as, a, as historically a T-cell person, but that's the way it is. Um, and so if we look at this in a phylogenetic tree, you see something like this. Um, as uh, somebody who studies influenza virus biology, I'm contractually obligated to occasionally say that um, influenza virus evolution follows sort of a ladder-like or stair-like phylogeny. Um, and so you can sort of see that here, where um, if we look over time in this time-resolved tree, where um, Xs denote the vaccine strains that were selected for uh, vaccines as we go along. Um, the trunk of the tree follows this sort of stair-like pattern. There's like a, you know, every couple of years, there's a proliferation of viruses that belong to a particular clade. That clade dies out, a new clade takes over, and this is thought to be mediated by um, immune selection sort of at the global scale, the scale of, of uh, human populations, right? So this is the process that we call antigenic drift. Now, in SARS-CoV-2 evolution, we haven't really seen um, like settling into this stair-like pattern. Instead, we've seen what you might call punctuated equilibria. And so now we're living in this um, sort of variant soup era where there's a number of different uh, variants that are co-circulating. But um, even so, every once in a while, uh, one of these sort of um, vies for dominance and begins to expand in the, the global population. And then historically, we've seen these waves um, of emergence of, of new variants, starting with the alpha variant of concern and then moving on to delta. They seem to cause waves of new infection. They infect a lot of people and then they are supplanted by other viruses. But so far, this isn't something that is happening on a sort of annually recurring basis. It's happening uh, more or less constantly and it's difficult for us to predict um, when new variants will, will arise and start to do this. Um, unless you think that this is, um, you know, a process that sort of came to an end with the Omicron variant that, you know, the last Greek letter variant that we decided collectively to name, um, this is really an ongoing process. And so um, right now we're sort of concerned about 
this variant called uh, BA.2.86 and um, its progeny, especially JN.1 here, which as you can see from uh, this particular tree, and this is an image that I took from the, the very nice substack of Eric Topol. I don't know if you read his stuff, but he's a great summarizer of the literature. Um, he put together um, this visual showing, here are these new, uh, newly emerging BA.2.86 viruses off on this branch over here. Um, the most recent uh, booster strain that, that uh, is in the, the current vaccine is this one here, XBB.1.5. And so you see that they're sort of phylogenetically distant from each other. Um, this JN.1 variant incorporates a number of, uh, of mutations that are in the parental BA.2.86 and an additional mutation called L455S in the spike uh, protein, which you think is important for uh, mediating escape from antibody responses. So this sort of emergence of new variants that are distinct from previously circulating variants with the capacity, at least potential capacity to escape immune responses continues to happen. So where are these viruses coming from? Super important. How do we know which ones to be concerned about? Um, earlier this week, the CDC and WHO uh, announced an update saying that they are going to consider this BA.2.86 variant um, and its derivatives of variants of interest or VOIs, which is like a tier below variants of concern. So as we learn more about the capacity for these viruses to transmit, they seem to be increasing in proportion of infections in places in the world where they have already emerged. Um, we're going to want to uh, track how, uh, how these viruses um, spread through populations. So far, BA.2.86 and its variants do not appear to be associated with increasing hospitalizations or deaths associated with COVID-19 disease. Um, but that could also be that uh, there's some evidence that, that BA.2.86 has somewhat reduced replicative fitness relative to um, other variants. And so as JN.1 and other variants maybe restore that fitness, then uh, they might be uh, variants to become concerned about. I hope that all made sense. Um, so where do these new variants come from? Can we, if not predict, at least sort of forecast um, trends in future virus evolution? And if we understand how these variants are generated and selected, could we target our surveillance efforts um, to places where such variants are likely to arise and better inform um, our ability to, to track the emergence of these uh, viruses in the future. And this question sort of relates nicely to uh, a broader question that my lab has grappled with for some time, which is really how are processes of within host viral evolution um, linked to global processes? So I showed you at the beginning the um, ladder-like phylogeny of influenza viruses in human populations over the scale of years. Um, in that scale, we see a sort of predictable or you know more or less periodic um, evolutionary process where there is clearly immune selection that is resulting in the um, emergence and spread of new variants. But when we look at individuals where, after all, these new variants should emerge, like ultimately all of these new variants arose in one infected person and spread from there to other infected people, um, we see that the, the processes are much different and, and harder to predict and sort of more ruled by stochasticity. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. So first of all, we know that um, persistent RNA viruses can um, undergo dramatic within-host evolution in the course of infection of one individual. Uh, in my own PhD work, I, I did a lot of studies of a simian immunodeficiency virus infection of individual macaques. Um, HIV is kind of the poster child for a within-host viral evolution. Here is a graph showing sort of the key parameters in the natural history of HIV infection in one person. So as we go from days to weeks to years of infection, um, you know, we might characterize this as the early acute infection and in days and early weeks. Um, moving into chronic infection, we know that HIV um, cannot be cleared by the immune system. And you see here that as we follow uh, viral RNA loads in plasma. They peak early after a few weeks of infection, and they settle down into what we call a set point, where in untreated individuals, there is constant and 
unremitting virus replication in the face of an ongoing immune response, both a cellular um, and a humoral immune response. This immune response exerts selective pressure on the virus, and we and many others have been able to watch over time as um, viruses in one individual accumulate mutations that allow them to escape from detection by um, specific immune responses mounted by that individual. So chronic infections allow viruses to kind of adapt themselves to hide from the specific set of immune responses that one individual makes. We know that's also true in veterinary viruses. Um, so uh, another retrovirus, equine infectious anemia virus, um, the disease associated with this virus is characterized by sort of constant um, remitting and relapsing uh, syndromes. And the underlying biological mechanism of this is that a variant infects the horse initially that might be brought under control by a humoral immune response, but um, ongoing within host uh, evolution uh, results in the emergence of a variant that is adapted to this you know, red antibody response. Um, and then because EIAV does not cause immune deficiency per se, the horse can mount a new response to this virus and control it, but then a new variant emerges and so forth. And so ultimately you have cycles of, um, of immune control and immune evasion by the virus within that persistently infected host. So overall, we know from other examples that this unremitting virus replication in a setting with high mutation rates, which RNA viruses have, and probably a high effective population size inside the host, um, facilitates viruses' ability to adapt to immune pressure and other selective pressures within that particular host. So we know this is true for chronic persistent virus infections. And broadly speaking, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't do these things, right? So we know that um, onward transmission after one individual gets infected, the so-called serial interval, um, is three to seven days from uh, initial estimates for during the early phase of the pandemic for Omicron viruses. It's been estimated that the serial interval is even faster, maybe two days. Um, and so that's not a whole lot of time for the virus to replicate in one individual before it is transmitted to somebody else. So that's kind of the opposite of a chronic persistent infection, right? And so um, in addition to this, whenever the virus is transmitted onward, um, it may undergo a genetic bottleneck. This is another thing that my lab has been working on, um, especially in the setting of influenza for some years. And we think that bottlenecks are actually really important, let me move this, um, in uh, determining the sort of efficiency of selection of new variants. So if we think that the bottlenecks between hosts might be stringent, that is, suppose that new infections um, involve the transfer of a very small number of viruses from one infected host to another, then even if a potentially beneficial variant like this uh, bluish green virus here were to arise in one host, um, the chances that it spreads to another host because it's very low frequency in this one, um, the chances are very low. And so a stringent bottleneck overall would tend to reduce the chances that even a beneficial variant could efficiently spread in the population. If you had a loose transmission bottleneck involving the transfer of many viruses from one infected individual to another, well, then you could see that um, maybe this variation would persist. So more of the viral diversity within one host could be transmitted to the next. And this would allow each um, infection cycle that beneficial variant to increase its uh, proportion um, in the viral population within one host, and then much more quickly um, you know, become predominant in the population. So these transmission bottlenecks and their sizes also um, are important potential constraints or facilitators of, of viral evolution and variant spread. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's try to put all of that together um, and ask for SARS-CoV-2, how much viral diversity is there in one acutely infected person? And what is the likelihood that any diversity within that one person gets to the next person? So this is a study that we did um, with uh, a number of colleagues here, can I turn this off? Let me hold on. So, high uh, flow immune controls. There we go. Thank you. Reading glasses. So, um, 
this is a study that we did with a number of colleagues and was uh, led by uh, uh, Kat Braun, who was then a MD PhD student in my lab um, and a former PhD student, uh, now a professor at UPenn, uh, Louise Monkla. Um, and so what we wanted to do was just ask, okay, if we sequence virus populations in people who are acutely infected with SARS-CoV-2, uh, how many genome variants are there in these acutely infected people? And so uh, we counted up the number of intra-host single nucleotide variants or ISNVs in these individuals. And then, so here's just a histogram where Kat and Louise are, are counting up, well, within host mutations in the genome, how many are there? Well, um, in a substantial proportion of our samples, there were no within host mutations detected at all. Um, the largest single um, number of mutations that we uh, detected was one mutation. Um, and then maybe we found in some samples, nine, 10, or 11 genome mutations. That, that's not really a whole lot of variability in a 30,000 nucleotide viral genome in an acutely infected person, right? What are the frequencies of these uh, ISNPs? So like when we find mutations is a substantial proportion of the virus population in that person uh, carrying that mutation? Well, no, not really. The vast majority of these substitutions are very low in frequency. So there is some within host viral diversity in people acutely infected with SARS-CoV-2, um, but these within host variants are relatively low in frequency um, and they're not uh, rising to high frequency very quickly in these infected individuals. So when these people transmit virus onto someone else, um, does any of that diversity get transmitted? So uh, in order to answer this question, uh, we were able to look at uh, 28 likely um, household transmission pairs. So um, uh, groups where two or more people in the same household became infected within a week of each other. We often had um, epidemiologic evidence suggesting who was the first person to get infected. And so what we did was just compare um, the frequency and identity of a particular mutation um, in the index patient, the first one who got infected, um, and then we compared that with the frequency of that same mutation in the contact. And so um, what you might expect, if there is a substantially, like a large transmission bottleneck, right? So if a lot of viruses go from one person to the next, um, then whatever the frequency of a, a mutation is in the index patient, it should have about the same uh, frequency in the contact. And so you would expect these dots to line up on sort of a 45 degree angle here, right? but we don't see that. What we see is that mutations are essentially in the contact, they're either close to fixed in their virus population or um, pretty uh, low frequency, maybe lost, right? And so um, this suggests that a relatively small number of viruses is being transmitted from one patient to another. And we actually estimated that transmission bottleneck size. And, and yeah, it's probably on the order of, of one to 10 viruses making it from one person to another in the household transmission setting. Um, and then Louise modeled um, uh, the, the transmission of mutations from one individual to another and basically asked, you know, based on um, the average serial interval that we knew about um, and the estimated substitution rate um, in the SARS-CoV-2 viral genome, what is the probability that mutations arising in one individual will make it to another? So like how different um, are the consensus genome sequences in the index versus the contact. And in the majority of cases, so um, in this modeling scheme, in about 60% of the cases, we would expect the transmitted virus to be identical to the consensus sequence in the index. And so most of the time, um, we would expect there to be maybe one consensus difference or probably none. So altogether, this means that we're seeing small genetic bottlenecks. It is unlikely for mutations that arise in one individual to be transmitted to another in acute infections, right? So overall viral diversity is low, mutations are rarely transmitted onward. So it's hard to imagine how even chains of serial acute transmission could lead to the accumulation of large numbers of adaptive mutations in the viral genome. So where the heck are these viruses coming from, right? So hopefully that convinces you that acute infections are unlikely to contribute much to SARS-CoV-2 evolution, but now we're left with the same question that we started with, well, where the heck are these things coming from? So 
one thing the the um, many of us studying viral evolution noticed about the emergence of variants like alpha and then omicron is that if you um, plotted the number of mutations in um, spike S1, so this is the domain of the spike protein that's responsible for attaching to the host cell receptor ACE2. It's also the target of most neutralizing antibodies, so it's under strong selective pressure. If we sort of plot the accumulation of mutations in the spike S1 domain over time, um, you find that um, there's sort of a clock-like accumulation of substitutions, more or less. So there's like a line you can draw here. Um, but all of a sudden, when Omicron emerges, it's well above this line. So there are many more mutations in the Omicron virus at the moment it emerges than we would expect based on the kind of steady rate that um, the virus had been accumulating mutations up to that point. So what does that mean? And we'll, we'll come back to, to this also. I guess one other point to make here is that um, these viruses on this phylogeny, Omicron viruses, do not descend directly from the Delta viruses that had immediately preceded them in general circulation. So if you remember, we were all infected with Delta. There was this Delta wave, right? Um, and then Omicron came out of nowhere um, around the end of the semester as completely different. And did it descend from Delta viruses? No, it did not. In fact, they last had a common ancestor maybe um, in mid-2020. So a full year and a half before um, the Delta or before the Omicron viruses emerged. So what is going on here? Well, if we look at the phylogeny like this, maybe we can see it a little bit better. Here are the Omicron variants. Here are your Delta variants. And so when we look at this common ancestor, again, it's back in 2020. Um, what does this mean? Well, it suggests that, um, that somewhere along the line, an evolutionary branch of the early uh, epidemic, early pandemic viruses split off and underwent um, evolution that we did not observe. And that product much later was Omicron. So these variants of concern appear to have evolved over a long time from older, more ancestral variants. That BA.2.86 virus that I mentioned earlier, it has the same sort of long branch on the phylogeny leading to it as we observed for Omicron viruses. It is most closely related to Omicron BA.2 viruses that last circulated uh, like in March to May of 2022 but it's only recently emerged. So again, it's undergone a long period of evolution that we do not have um, a record of. So people have been asking, what are the processes that could account for this type of evolutionary saltation or jump? So there are three hypotheses that have been put forward as leading hypotheses. One, maybe you could have prolonged circulation in an unsampled human population. So Omicron was first detected in South Africa. Um, people hypothesized that, you know, there's been a interruption in, in the provision of antiretroviral therapy to people uh, infected with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, maybe in neighboring countries where there's not as much, you know, medical infrastructure, not a robust mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance program. Maybe, um, you know, there's a population of people um, in which this virus evolved. But I think that with the level of international connectivity that we see, the um, speed with which other variants have been detected throughout the world after they emerged, it seems unlikely that a variant this different and this infectious would be unsampled for a very long period of time um, if it was circulating in humans. So I think that we can um, say that this hypothesis is relatively unlikely. Uh, another possibility is that the virus was circulating in an unsampled animal reservoir and eventually spilled back into humans. Okay, um, well, let's consider that. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 can infect a wide range of different animals. Um, you may be aware that there have been a, a number of studies, especially in the United States, looking at the seroprevalence, so the number of the proportion of deer that have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, and they are amazingly positive. So um, depending on where you sample, 30% of deer or more might have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, in indicating that the virus has entered deer populations, 
genomic evidence suggests that it's entered deer populations numerous times in different states uh, throughout the United States and has evolved within deer to adapt to deer. So it has circulated within the deer population. Okay, so could there be spill back of deer viruses into humans? Well, maybe, um, but except for one case in Ontario, um, there's really no evidence in all of the genomic surveillance that has been done um, that humans are being infected with viruses that look like deer viruses. So I don't think deer are our culprit. Um, we know that the viruses cause large scale outbreaks, mink farms. And in that case, um, we've seen documented transmission from mink back into humans. And those mink are housed in such tight quarters that the virus goes through many, many rounds of uh, transmission and replication, and then ultimately gets back into people. And in this phylogeny here, which I have to put my reading glasses on to see, um, what you notice is that there are, are human cases um, in multiple different um, taxa of this tree that, um, that uh, co-segregate with mink um, uh, sequences. And so what this suggests to us is that there are separate introductions back into humans from viruses that were replicating in mink in these outbreaks. So it is absolutely plausible that a virus could enter an animal population, replicate there for a while, accumulate some animal specific mutations and come back into people. But so far, the animal lineages that have been characterized do not clearly match variants that we've detected in widespread human circulation. Like it's been pretty easy to pick out um, mink related sequences to people who worked on mink farms, um, but we don't see these spreading in the general population. So that also it seems like an unsatisfying uh, explanation for where these viruses are coming from. But as I showed you earlier, we know that prolonged infections can promote viral diversification and adaptation to selective pressures. And so what about prolonged infections with SARS-CoV-2? Now we know um, that people who are immune compromised are at risk for prolonged infections with other respiratory viruses that typically cause acute infections um, in immunocompetent people. So um, Jesse Bloom and uh, his then student, Catherine Shui, um, had a really lovely study in eLife in 2017, where they followed four immunocompromised cancer patients who were infected with um, influenza virus A subtype H3N2, so one of the two predominant um, seasonal influenza viruses circulating in people. These four individuals had infections lasting somewhere between 40 and 70 days, I want to say, um, in the seasons indicated here, 2005-06 or 06-07. And what they're showing in this figure um, is in the orange colors, mutations that are uh, resulting in amino acid substitutions in hemagglutinin or HA. This is the influenza virus attachment protein. So it's analogous to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The job of hemagglutinin is to attach influenza viruses to target cells, right? So it's also the target of antibodies. And so they're saying that there are these amino acid substitutions in HA in these individuals as the virus replicates over um, many days and weeks, um, including substitutions in amino acid sites um, that we know involve um, interactions with antibodies and um, are around the receptor binding domain for, for HA. And then they find that in future um, global sequences, so in future seasons, um, these same mutations that were rare at the time, but arose in these individuals, they become common in viruses that circulate a few seasons later. So they are not arguing that like the viruses they detected in their four cancer patients at Fred Hutch, like later went global and like caused, you know, the flu season three years later, but rather that they have uncovered a process by which such viruses might arise when they don't typically arise in acute infections. So maybe rare infections that last a much longer time are important sources of new variants that can um, both achieve some immune escape, but also replicative fitness. And then uh, if they escape out of these individuals, um, could go global. So interestingly, um, we found a, a patient um, here at UW Health um, who had, uh, had a congenital um, 
immune uh, compromise. And this individual um, had a set of relapsing symptoms associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and so my student Kat um, worked up this, uh, this individual together um, with Peter Hafman um, at the Influenza Research Institute and Nick Miner, a very talented um, technician in Dave O'Connor's lab. This is just a summary that Kat put together of um, all of the hospitalization symptoms and therapies received by this individual um, who had a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection that lasted more than 400 days. So more than a year, they were infected with um, what sequencing showed to be probably the same virus. It wasn't that they were continually reinfected, that they became infected, never cleared their virus. And importantly, um, round about day 200 after initial symptom onset, um, they were treated with the monoclonal antibody bamlanivimab, bamlanivimab, bamlanivimab. I'll call it BAM. So they were given BAM uh, around about this time, but this did not resolve their infection. Okay, and so you can see that um, persistent hypoxia, so low, um, so low uh, blood oxygen and so forth, um, persisted even after this treatment. And um, what Nick is trying to do here is show you mutations in the viral genomes that we were able to collect from um, this person. Um, and these black dots represent mutations. Um, I think, oh, I don't have it here. So these black dots represent mutations um, that became or that changed in frequency over time in this individual. These gray dots um, are mutations relative to the Wuhan one reference that sort of persisted throughout that we think represents just like the genetic variant with which this person was initially infected. And unfortunately, we don't have many samples um, for about a hundred day span after they were treated with this BAM monoclonal antibody. Um, but what you see is that after this treatment, there is a complete turnover in the virus population and selection for a large number of additional mutations throughout the genome, including in spike, which is um, shown here across time. And these triangles represent um, mutations at a spike amino acid site 484, which we um, know from other studies is uh, important for recognition by a lot of antibodies. And when Peter cultured virus from um, this individual and asked whether it was susceptible to treatment with a variety of clinically available monoclonal antibodies that were available at the time, um, what we see here is like the ability of, of the BAM antibody to um, inhibit 99% of virus replication is essentially totally gone. So no matter how much of this antibody Peter adds to the um, culture, the virus from this patient is completely resistant to that antibody treatment, although it is susceptible to treatment with um, other antibodies. So here's the, in the um, purple squares is a control virus. Okay, does that all make sense? So what we see here is that there is chronic infection of an immunocompromised person that has resulted in ongoing virus diversification within that individual. And when we apply a selective pressure in the form of a single monoclonal antibody that was meant to clear infection, what we get is viral adaptation and escape from that antibody. Okay. So persistent infection facilitates the ability of the virus to adapt to selective pressures within a single host. So all of this together um, caused us to hypothesize that SARS-CoV-2 can establish tissue reservoirs that facilitate viral persistence and the evolution of new variants. So from our study and from many other studies, there are reports that the virus um, can infect many different tissue sites, we know that the ACE2 receptor is expressed on multiple tissues throughout the body. Autopsy studies have shown um, that the virus can disseminate widely throughout the body within probably the first uh, flush of acute infection. People who have been infected for uh, between 14 and 200 and some days have undergone autopsy and virus and viral RNA is found throughout the body, including in the brain. Um, furthermore, as time has gone on since 2021, there have been increasing numbers of individual case reports and case series, so a single uh, report describing multiple individuals, um, that have described cases of persistent infections in immunocompromised persons. So it 
medical centers across the world, people have observed that people who are immunocompromised tend to have trouble resolving SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in at least some of those cases, we observe extensive within-host diversification, similar to the patient that I showed you from UW Health. The risk factors for developing this persistent infection are just now beginning to be studied. Um, colleagues of ours at the University of Michigan and at Mass General uh, have conducted some of the first prospective cohort studies uh, of immunocompromised people, and they find that um, B cell suppression or B cell dysfunction is a lead suspect, which could be through multiple causes. It could be iatrogenic, meaning like caused by a specific treatment to suppress B cell function, or it could be through uh, untreated HIV infection or congenital immune deficiencies, other things like that. But that seems to be an important risk factor. Um, more studies needed to really identify that. And interestingly, um, there have been a couple of meta-analyses that looked at viral sequences from such patients, and they find that there are sites in the viral genome where you can observe recurring independent substitutions. So these are examples of potential convergent evolution. One of those sites is the um, amino acid site 484 and spike that I mentioned in the individual in our study. So we know that those sites are involved in antibody recognition of the spike protein. So all of these things add up to a picture where um, immunocompromised people can have persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection. And if they do, um, at least in some of those people, the virus can adapt to uh, escape from their immune responses. Now, interestingly, there is a longitudinal cohort study that was done in the UK uh, enrolling about 70,000 people where they mailed out swabs to people just kind of randomly. Um, they had them swab themselves and send the, the samples back to the lab. Those were tested for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and they were just collecting viral genomes um, in that study. But recently, this group reported that as many as one in 200 people in that 70,000 person cohort that was sampled over time um, may shed SARS-CoV-2 RNA at least in nasal secretions for two months or even more. So not all of those people um, are clinically immune suppressed. You know, they're not all cancer patients. They're not all, um, you know, people with profound immune deficiency. So the actual prevalence of at least prolonged SARS-CoV-2 infection may be longer or maybe larger than uh, we previously anticipated. So we asked the question, um, if somebody sequenced a virus from a persistent infection, so we know there's this, you know, intense effort out there to collect SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences, report them to public databases, share that information and try to use it to understand um, how the virus is evolving globally and locally. Um, so if someone were to deposit a sequence from a person with a prolonged infection, uh, how would we know that? Like, is there a way that we can trawl these databases um, for, uh, for evidence of persistent infections? Um, as I like to say in my lab, um, there's this uh, there's this fake onion, uh, like onion fake TED talk from several years ago, um, where there's a guy who says, like, I am an ideas man. I have ideas like, let's build flying cars. I don't know how to build a flying car, so you will figure out how to do that, and then I'll go and have another idea. Um, and so I feel like sometimes as a PI, like that's my job. I have an idea. I'm not really sure how we're going to do that exactly, but like maybe you guys could help me figure that out and then we'll do it. So um, I mentioned Nick Miner, a very talented um, bioinformatics technician in Dave's lab. So I said to him, like, there's got to be a way that we could look for signals of um, sort of like hypermutation um, in databases, you know, in like GenBank and, and Gizade where these sequences are deposited. Um, and let's see if we can pull those out of the database. And so we thought about it together with uh, Wan Ting Wei, a student in my lab, and Tatya Cole, an uh, actual card-carrying uh, quantitative evolutionary biologist. Um, and so what we came up with was, well, okay, we know that over time, um, you know, I showed you, this is sort of another version of this like variant soup that occurs, right? But like there are variants that are prevalent at any time during the pandemic. So in gray, we see these ancestral variants and then uh, alpha emerges and it's causing most infections and then delta and so forth. And so we can basically um, ascribe to most times in the history of the pandemic, 
um, at any given time, there was a dominant variant. And that dominant variant, even though there are, you know, mutations on that background, um, you know, there are tools now that will assign a sequence to a lineage and say, okay, like this virus looks like a Delta virus. Okay. So you could imagine that if you find a virus today, infecting someone sampled yesterday, that looks like a Delta virus. Well, that's kind of weird because Delta basically went extinct in 2021. So if we see a virus that looks like a Delta virus, well, then that would cause, um, you know, that would cause our spidey senses to tingle a little bit, right? Um, and especially if it looked like a Delta virus in most of the genome, but say had a number of non-synonymous mutations in spike, well, like that would begin to, to resemble these evolutionary saltation viruses that we've been describing, right? So that would be a virus that would be related to a sequence that circulated some time ago, but had unique substitutions um, in spike. That, that is what BA.2.86, this new variant of interest, that's what it is, right? It's a virus that is related to a previously circulating virus, but has a weird spike sequence. So we wanted to trawl the database for these. We called such sequences that were sort of out of their time, right? So if we detected a sequence here that actually belonged to like this lineage or this lineage, um, we call that an anachronistic sequence. So we had to think a lot about how to build an algorithm that essentially would divide the database into a month by month chunk of sequences and then ask for the sequences that were deposited in um, November, 2022. How many of those, um, like we are going to cluster them together and then we're going to compare these clusters of sequences to each other and ask, okay, first of all, we'd expect to see maybe a few sequences that are very distantly related to the vast majority of sequences that exist. And then we would guess that those sequences that are sort of outliers um, may belong to um, these commonly circulating lineages, but they maybe have a number of additional mutations. And so um, Nick basically built an algorithm to, to find these. Um, and so if you start looking, you do indeed find viruses that were collected, say in August, 2022, that um, have a genetic background that looks like viruses that circulated in May, 2021. Um, and so the algorithm seemed to work to pull out these you know, anachronistic sequences, which may or may not represent actual, you know, persistent infections. But interestingly, when we look, the GenBank database contains over uh, 1,300 anachronistic SARS-CoV-2 sequences that were collected in the year 2022. And so now what we want to do is pull down all of these sequences and analyze them to ask, do they have these other attributes that we would expect um, for these sorts of evolutionary saltations. And then would that give us a larger sample of such sequences to analyze and ask like, what made viruses like Omicron successful? You know, do events like this occur much more frequently than we currently appreciate, but most of those viruses have some defect that prevents them from um, efficiently being transmitted onward? Or is it just luck that uh, a lot of these viruses do not circulate more widely. Um, so these are questions that we're looking forward to addressing in the near future. Okay, so to bring it all to a close, um, I hope that I've convinced you that there's a pretty good argument to be made that unusually prolonged SARS-CoV-2 infections are likely sources of new variant viruses in human populations. The same concept could apply for influenza and other antigenically variable viruses that typically cause acute infections, but may cause prolonged infections in some subset of hosts. I think that characterizing these variants could provide a window into future virus evolution, and finding these cases is probably also important for treating and resolving persistent infections in the individuals in which they occur, because those people are, are probably at risk from those infections, whether they realize it or not. I think that SARS-CoV-2 persistence in tissue reservoirs may underlie at least some of these cases of post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or PASC. So there's some evidence that um, there can be persistence of, of virus RNA, viral antigens, and maybe even infectious virus in um, gut tissue, for example. And so if that underlies some cases of long COVID, well, then maybe treatment to resolve that infection could also resolve the symptoms of long COVID. 
And I think that immunocompromised people remain at risk for persistent and serious COVID-19 infections. And so it's important for that population of people that we can improve diagnosis and treatment of these long infections. And that has knock-on benefits for public health too, if you believe the rest of the stuff that I've told you today. So we'd like to know how common these persistent infections are, um, what proportion of such infections might involve extensive within host evolution, what's the role of tissue reservoirs in this persistence, and, and are there ways that we could treat patients to eliminate these reservoirs if we do find them, um, and then viruses in such infections, and then cryptic lineages, which are these lineages that we detect in wastewater that I didn't have time to talk about today, um, they appear to be evolving under diversifying selection. So there's a preponderance of non-synonymous substitutions in the, these viral genomes. So that suggests that they are responding to some selective pressure. What is their fitness for replication and transmission in healthy individuals? So like, are these viruses by and large, if they happen to get into a new host, like would they cause an infection? Could they like be the next Omicron? Um, or do most of them have these fitness defects that, that I mentioned earlier? So these are all questions and more um, that we want to address in the future. So uh, I'd like to thank many, many people um, in my lab and Dave O'Connor's lab. So um, Dave and I have worked closely together on all SARS-CoV-2 research that, that we've done since uh, February of 2020. Um, a number of other people, uh, both locally and far away. Um, I'd just like to mention that a lot of our work has um, involved a, a new collaboration with the Wisconsin um, State Department of Health Services and a local public health in, in Madison and Dane County. That's been really great to interact with all of these people. Um, of course, we'd like to thank all of our funders, everyone in my lab, and all of you for paying attention today. Thank you so much. Yes. So, so good question. So, um, so maybe that slide on the mink thing was a little misleading. So everybody who was infected with the mink virus and that phylogeny that I showed, they were a mink farmer. So, so they had like a clear, um, risk for getting infected with the mink virus. There is very little evidence that um, mink adapted viruses or deer adapted viruses, and by very little, I mean like almost none, um, that, that those viruses are circulating in humans. So the those anachronistic lineages that I showed you, those 1300, um, they look like human viruses outside of spike. Um, and they just look like viruses that were circulating several months before those viruses were sampled. Right. So that's what makes us think that maybe that means a person has been infected for several months. Now, when you contact some of the submitters, sometimes they say, oh, did I did I write um, 2022 on that sample when I submitted to GenBank? Actually, I meant 2021. And then you're like, oh, OK, that makes sense. But some of those are truly persistent. D does that resolve that yeah. question? OK, yeah. So, um, your uh, anachronistic lineages, it seems to me that one easy way to validate your algorithm would be to uh, construct the phylogeny and to see if we have long branches that have a that have a root deep, uh, deeper in the tree. And all yes. That. Have you done that? To, uh, we we have not done that yet, and we actually like we wanted to get away from phylogenetic approaches to do the initial screen because they'd be so computationally intensive with all of the sequences that we would be using, and so that's why we used a clustering approach just to find viruses that were divergent. But once we have our lineages, then yes, we want to place them in a phylogeny and test that exact hypothesis. Okay, so right. Yes. There's clearly variants of how long these viruses last in the individual. There's also a lot of variants in terms of which individuals transmit or how much they transmit the super spread. Is there any association between Yeah, good question. And I guess I should be like repeating for the, the folks in Zoom land. Um, so, the, so okay, hopefully you can hear that. So then, then the question is just, um, there's a lot of variability in the duration of persistent infections, and totally true, um, and a lot of variability in individuals' ability to spread to others. So um, is there some kind of overlap between those things? Um, quite possibly. 
So I think that, you know, there have been few enough evolutionary saltations that caused a major wave in the pandemic that that you could hypothesize that there's a number of factors that make it unlikely for a given variant no matter how diversified it has become, uh, you know, no matter how much uh, runaway evolution, as Trevor likes to say, has occurred in one individual, like it may just not get out of that individual for a number of reasons. Maybe they're bad at transmitting. Maybe it's adapted to grow well um, in that individual, but there's like, you know, it replicates in the lower respiratory tract and not the upper. And so it's not well adapted to acute transmission in humans anymore. Um, I think, Probably all of these things will be true in different cases, but we just don't know enough about the variety of persistent infections and the evolution of viruses in those persistent infections to draw conclusions about that yet, I don't think. We have a question in the chat from William Saucer. What is the molecular or physiologic nature of the stringent transmission bottleneck? Oh, that's a great question. So, so why is a stringent bottleneck stringent? Um, so that's a great question and one that we're actually, so um, Andy Maley and I are, are working um, on a system where we're trying to address that very thing. Like what are the, um, what are the factors that contribute to the bottleneck that we observe? Um, and you could imagine that at every stage in transmission from one individual to another, there are probably bottlenecks. So the bottleneck is probably a set of bottlenecks. So the viruses that are replicating in me are not equally fit for transmission. Um, there are studies suggesting that there are specific anatomical sites that um, play a greater role in the viruses that are transmitted from one host to another. So influenza viruses that replicate in the soft palate may be more likely, like as I'm talking to you now, I am making respiratory droplets and they are like fanning out to all of these people. And some of them um, may contain respiratory viruses if I have the flu, right? And so maybe the ones in my soft palate are most likely to be able to travel to infect someone else. That itself is a bottleneck in the index host. Not all of the ones that I emit will be breathed in by someone else. Maybe some of the people who breathe them in have pre-existing immunity and don't get infected. Um, maybe like the virus has to land in the right place in the um, recipient to initiate a spreading infection. Um, so I think that there's a number of, uh, of places where these bottlenecks could occur. And we even have some preliminary data with molecularly barcoded viruses that suggests that this could be true. So like if you look at molecular barcodes, there's a huge diversity in a directly inoculated animal. Um, a substantial proportion of that diversity, so maybe hundreds of distinct barcodes, get transferred from that directly inoculated animal to a contact. Um, but maybe two or three barcodes actually account for um, most replicating viruses three days after contact. And so there's probably multiple stages at which the virus population is winnowed. Yes. Do you know how long an infection was expected necessary to have an official rate of actually transferring into these variants as opposed to the people that are constantly transferring into these? So that's a good question. So basically, like, how long would it take for diversification to result in some kind of like meaningfully different virus? Right. Yeah, good question. So uh, we don't know, um, you know, and I think people have sort of given some heuristic numbers that I don't know where they come from exactly. Um, so there's a group at Mount Sinai that has collected um, a cohort of patients who have persistent infection. And they said that they feel like maybe three months um, is sort of some kind of cutoff point. And before that, you're unlikely to see the accumulation of too many consensus changing mutations. Um, you know, notably the patient that we follow, we don't have um, samples from before the first like five months or something. So we don't, we can't track it all the way back to the beginning. So I don't know what happened in that person. I'm curious to know what role can co-infection or divergent strains plays in this, or maybe that's too sporadic to exert a lot of pressure. Uh, like when you see kind of spatial radiation from the parents, 
where the frost leaves? Is there any indication that something interesting happens there, or there's just not enough known to say? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so coronaviruses are notorious for extensive within host recombination. And so where the two fronts meet, as you put it, like you would expect there to be recombinants. Um, and sporadically in literature and you know in the news, we've heard about potential recombinants. There's like a Delta Cron that people were worried about. Um, and you know, these these forms that we see. <clears throat> that are derived from uh, you know, a variant like BA.2.86, um, they probably represent recombination with other forms. And so recombination is definitely occurring and it's definitely causing um, diversification of virus sequences. Um, and then of course, like it's up to selection to, to show us which of those you know is most transmissible given the like changing landscape of, of like host susceptibility that we have now. Please join me in thanking Thomas Reader for his wonderful presentation. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Uh, okay. For our class discussion, we're going to move over to 13 and 16. So. Got it. Much easier to put that conversation.